My fellow Americans, tonight I want to speak with you about why the United States is leading the international effort to restore democratic government in Haiti. Haiti's dictators, led by General Raoul Cedras, control the most violent regime in our hemisphere. For three years, they have rejected every peaceful solution that the international community has proposed. They have broken an agreement that they made to give up power. They have brutalized their people and destroyed their economy. And for three years, we and other nations have worked exhaustively to find a diplomatic solution, only to have the dictators reject each one. Now the United States must protect our interests to stop the brutal atrocities that threaten tens of thousands of Haitians, to secure our borders, and to preserve stability and promote democracy in our hemisphere, and to uphold the reliability of the commitments we make and the commitments others make to us. Earlier today, I ordered Secretary of Defense Perry to call up the military reserve personnel necessary to support United States troops in any action we might undertake in Haiti. I have also ordered two aircraft carriers, the USS Eisenhower and the USS America, into the region. I issued these orders after giving full consideration to what is at stake. The message of the United States to the Haitian dictators is clear. Your time is up. Leave now or we will force you from power. I want the American people to understand the background of the situation in Haiti, how what has happened there affects our national security interests, and why I believe we must act now. Nearly 200 years ago, the Haitian people rose up out of slavery and declared their independence. Unfortunately, the promise of liberty was quickly snuffed out. And ever since, Haiti has known more suffering and repression than freedom. In our time, as democracy has spread throughout our hemisphere, Haiti has been left behind. Then, just four years ago, the Haitian people held the first free and fair elections since their independence. They elected a parliament and a new president, Father Jean-Bertrand Aristide, a Catholic priest who received almost 70% of the vote. But eight months later, Haitian dreams of democracy became a nightmare of bloodshed. General Raul Cedros led a military coup that overthrew President Aristide, the man who had appointed Cedros to lead the army. Resistors were beaten and murdered. The dictators launched a horrible intimidation campaign of rape, torture, and mutilation. People starved, children died, thousands of Haitians fled their country heading to the United States across dangerous seas. At that time, President Bush declared the situation posed, and I quote, an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security, foreign policy, and economy of the United States. Cedros and his armed thugs have conducted a reign of terror, executing children, raping women, killing priests. As the dictators have grown more desperate, the atrocities have grown ever more brutal. Recent news reports have documented the slaying of Haitian orphans by the nation's deadly police thugs. The dictators are said to suspect the children of harboring sympathy toward President Aristide for no other reason than he ran an orphanage in his days as a parish priest. The children fled the orphanages for the streets. Now they can't even sleep there because they're so afraid. As one young boy told a visitor, I do not care if the police kill me because it only brings an end to my suffering. International observers uncovered a terrifying pattern of soldiers and policemen raping the wives and daughters of suspected political dissidents. Young girls, 13, 16 years old, people slain and mutilated with body parts left as warnings to terrify others. Children forced to watch as their mother's faces are slashed with machetes. A year ago, the dictators assassinated the Minister of Justice. Just last month, they gunned down Father Jean-Marie Vincent, a peasant leader and close friend of Father Aristide. Vincent was executed on the doorstep of his home, a monastery. He refused to give up his ministry, and for that, he was murdered. Let me be clear. 
General Sedros and his accomplices alone are responsible for this suffering and terrible human tragedy. It is their actions that have isolated Haiti. Neither the international community nor the United States has sought a confrontation. For nearly three years, we've worked hard on diplomatic efforts. The United Nations, the Organization of American States, the Caribbean community, the six Central American presidents, all have sought a peaceful end to this crisis. We have tried everything, persuasion and negotiation, mediation and condemnation. Emissaries were dispatched to Port-au-Prince and were turned away. The United Nations labored for months to reach an agreement acceptable to all parties. Then last year, General Cedros himself came here to the United States and signed an agreement on Governor's Island in New York in which he pledged to give up power along with the other dictators. But when the day came for the plan to take effect, the dictators refused to leave and instead increased the brutality they are using to cling to power. Even then, the nations of the world continued to seek a peaceful solution while strengthening the embargo we had imposed. We sent massive amounts of humanitarian aid, food for a million Haitians, and medicine to try to help the ordinary Haitian people as the dictators continued to loot the economy. Then this summer, they threw out the international observers who had blown the whistle on the regime's human rights atrocities. In response to that action, in July, the United Nations Security Council approved a resolution that authorizes the use of all necessary means, including force, to remove the Haitian dictators from power and restore democratic government. The Haitian people should know that we come in peace. And you, the American people, should know that our soldiers will not be involved in rebuilding Haiti or its economy. The international community, working together, must provide that economic, humanitarian, and technical assistance necessary to help the Haitians rebuild. When this first phase is completed, the vast majority of our troops will come home in months, not years. I want our troops and their families to know that we'll bring them home just as soon as we possibly can. Then, in the second phase, a much smaller U.S. force will join forces from other members of the United Nations. And their mission will leave Haiti after elections are held next year and a new Haitian government takes office in early 1996. Tonight, I can announce that President Aristide has pledged to step down when his term ends in accordance with the Constitution he has sworn to uphold. He has committed himself to promote reconciliation among all Haitians and to set an historic example by peacefully transferring power to a duly elected successor. He knows, as we know, that when you start a democracy, the most important election is the second election. President Aristide has told me that he will consider his mission fulfilled not when he regains office, but when he leaves office to the next democratically elected president of Haiti. He has pledged to honor the Haitian voters who put their faith in the ballot box. In closing, let me say that I know the American people are rightfully concerned whenever our soldiers are put at risk. Our volunteer military is the world's finest, and its leaders have worked hard to minimize risks to all our forces. But the risks are there, and we must be prepared for that. I assure you that no president makes decisions like this one without deep thought and prayer. But it's my job as president and commander-in-chief to take those actions that I believe will best protect our national security interests. Let me say again, the nations of the world have tried every possible way to restore Haiti's democratic government peacefully. The dictators have rejected every possible solution. The terror, the desperation, and the instability will not end until they leave. Once again, I urge them to do so. They can still move now and reduce the chaos and disorder, increase the security, the stability, and the safety in which this transfer back to democracy can occur. But if they do not leave now, the international community will act to honor our commitments, to give democracy a chance, not to guarantee it, 
to remove stubborn and cruel dictators, not to impose a future. I know many people believe that we shouldn't help the Haitian people recover their democracy and find their hard-won freedoms, that the Haitians should accept the violence and repression as their faith. But remember, the same was said of a people who more than 200 years ago took up arms against a tyrant whose forces occupied their land, but they were a stubborn bunch of people who fought for their freedoms and appealed to all those who believed in democracy to help their cause. And their cries were answered, and a new nation was born, a nation that ever since has believed that the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness should be denied to none. May God bless the people of the United States and the cause of freedom. Good night.